Number seven. Vehine al hayesoid haze oimid hi motze hayechelus la adam le hishtamish ban imzois bashimush haruchoni kemush shukasavnu el. Now we've established this foundation that it's possible for a person to utilize spiritual forces, as we've mentioned. Relief of puulais gedolos vechazokos masha inabev shoros hayshimush hagashmi. And he can use them to create wondrous things, very strong effects that would be impossible in the normal physical world. And this is because the master of the world set this up. Now, it's, it should be obvious, but it's important to state it again. This is not some oversight of the creator that we're able to exploit. This is very intentionally part of the design of creation, that we have the ability to utilize things in this way and to override the normal system. Shukulam nikshorim zeboze. Everything in reality is connected, the physical world and all of the spiritual realms above it. Vichulam teluim behashva oisav yizbarach shemai. And they all depend on Hashem's influence of energy. Shizachana, like we've mentioned. Ba'ifin. And that in the way that once some of this energy, some of this influence has been drawn forth as a result of a person mentioning one of these holy names of Hashem. That generates a result down here at the end of the chain. If you shake the top of the chain, that shows up all the way down at the bottom. And Hashem makes himself available, so to speak, to anyone that's calling out to him. When you invoke one of these names, it invokes that specific name's corresponding energy, something to do with mercy or the fact that Hashem is a father to you, whatever it may be. The Yoyer Oisa Ha'or, the Yashpia Oisa Hashpa, and that particular light will shine, and that energy will be drawn forth, Shibatuli Metsius Ha'inyan Ha'hu Hamavukush, that contains within it the nature, that reality that you intend. Ad Saifa Inyan Shibagashmius, until it shows up all the way down here in the physical world. The Amnam, furthermore, Oid Inyan Echod, Choka Kaboris Barachimai Al Zehaderech. Now, there's another method that Hashem created that we can utilize, theoretically. Malachim, angels, each one of them, on all of their respective levels, are given over a certain power, an ability to enact changes in the world. Now, in order to understand what's coming up here, it requires a little bit more background information how exactly malachim operate. Because one may get the impression, let's say, for example, the malach of healing, of refua is Raphael, the malach of war and strength is Gavriel. Now, you might think that these spiritual forces We've objectified them so much to the point where they sound like machines. They sound like all they are is really this unthinking conduit for a certain energy that shows up in the world that Hashem puts forth. Well, right, because the only, I I wouldn't say experience, but the only exposure that I have to angels is the kind of teaching that each angel is created for a very specific mission and that alone. So it does sound like a, a machine, basically. It does sound like that, but if we take that to its end, it would sort of break down because let's say if I would turn on a radio and sound starts coming out of the radio and you ask me, how does that work? Hmm. And I'll tell you, well, um, there's a malach that's appointed over this radio and Hmm. that every time I turn it on, the malach makes sound come forth from the radio. So you might say, okay. So does that mean if you're a big tzaddik, then maybe more sound will come out uh, or more often? Uh, What if you're you're not such a big tzaddik? Maybe the malach will decide not to. And I said, no, 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 it 
happens regardless. You press the radio and the Malach makes it happen. So at that point you say, well, what's the point of talking about the Malach at all? This is just a machine. Just call it a radio. You know, it, it has certain basic functions that operate with, uh, according to natural principles. Mm -hmm. And they happen regardless of anything else. And there seems to be no autonomy to the radio at all. So what, what difference does it make to assign some sort of spiritual title to it? So it, that is not the case. Malachim are not radios. They are not unthinking conduits of energy. They are actually aware entities. However, they are designated with a specific task that they can carry out, uh, an, a specific ability. For example, like we gave, Raphael has the power to heal. Now, of course, he doesn't have his own power because if you take it to that far extreme, then that becomes heretical, mm -hmm. right? He's not his own God. He does not contain within himself the power to heal. Hashem has channeled through him this ability. And the best example that we could give is maybe, let's say you have someone in your synagogue who's in charge of distributing tzedakah. So if people want to donate money and it goes to the call Gabai, who's works for the shul, helps out the shul, and he collects all of the money, all of the tzedakah money. He's given a certain amount of leeway to decide where that money should go. And he has that. He's been given a certain amount of authority to make decisions. Now, that's obviously within reason. He can't decide whatever he wants. He can't throw all of the money into some random cause on the other side of the world. That would... Gabi needs a Ferrari. So. <laughs> right, and for sure, something like that. There are limitations to what he's able to, to enact with his own will, but he is given the, a limited amount of authority to make decisions that this falls with on this falls under his realm. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is sort of how Malachim operate. And therefore, Malachim are given over a certain ability to perform tasks, each one a different kind of task. And they aren't constantly operating. For example, the Malach Raphael, who heals, he is not just constantly healing. It's not that this is some active force that's just constantly playing out in the world. This is a Malach that performs a task on specific occasions, in specific circumstances, when, it, when Hashem ultimately sees fit for him to do it so. Sounds like, it, it sounds like they have, to some extent, something akin to free will, just on a much more narrow band than we do, uh, where we talk about human free will is not infinite in any direction. You have kind of a band of what you can choose. Uh, it sounds like this is similar, but it's just a much more narrow range. And uh, it all has to bring them toward accomplishing their specific mission. Well, their free will, it's, it's dangerous to use that term because that term carries a very specific connotation that applies only to humans, that we have an ashama and a body and we can choose good or evil. Hmm. What they have, it looks like free will because they're making decisions, but what it really is is they, they've been programmed to have their own field of discretion. What I want to say is that this just sounds like, like actual AI, like where we are the human, we're the actual thing that exists within a Shama. And, and like the goal of what we're trying to make with, with AI is something that can think it wouldn't actually have free will. Um, but it would appear to be able to to think and make decisions and it would still be you know accomplishing whatever the goal is that its creator set out for it uh, that's what we're trying to do we're kind of uh we're, we're getting closer but i think there's a lot of reasons to think that that we aren't particularly close to actually succeeding in that but it sounds like angels are the actual version of that the actual ai that could be an accurate description I'm not an expert enough to to know exactly what are the nuanced differences between the capacity for AI and what Malachim are actually doing. I know for a fact that Malachim are aware and AI is not. Mm. So that is one difference. So they, they do have, again, what resembles free will in the sense that they can make decisions and they have the ability for discretion. But 
their free will is ultimately meaningless. So their, their free will is not connected to any aspect of independence like it is for humans. The difference is a human free will has the ability to change all of reality. And it has implications that affect the outcome of the world to come and your own personal state. You have this godliness, this power of choosing God over other things. And angels don't have that. They are naturally drawn to God. Mm. They, they aren't drawn the other way I and see. have the ability to choose between the two. Right. So that, that's what I meant that their free will, so to speak, is insignificant or meaningless because it doesn't, it doesn't have any actual moral implications. Mm -hmm. They're not drawn to anything else. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Sure. So, so we were saying that these angels don't operate constantly. They operate in a normal, standard way, sometimes over here, sometimes over there. Amnam, yesh b'kaycham. Now, even though they're not constantly operating, they have the ability, potentially, to operate more than they naturally would. And also with greater force and strength than would be normal otherwise. So even though they don't operate that way, they operate in a natural way, so to speak, the way Hashem designed them, they are capable of performing more. And along these lines, there are many instances there are great miracles that we would call that occur. Wondrous things that, uh, that appear in the world, like the splitting of the sea, all according to Hashem's will, the Eishiyirtze, when Hashem wants. Now Hashem decreed, ordered the world that when a name, when a certain name that is associated with a malach in its order, and specifically a malach that, that does some sort of action that is associated with the world, with that name, Al Hashem Hashpa Shabad Nitla Ha'inyan Ha'ukule, that activates that procedure that that Malach is designed to do. Hine Yuchra Hamalach Lifal, that Malach is then forced to obey. And you can coerce a Malach to do certain actions. In order to make that malach operate in a way that, like we said, is more than its normal occurrence. And this is in accordance with the person who is invoking this name, that he is forcing these spiritual entities to do his will. So now it comes out, really there are two ways, there are two methods of accomplishing supernatural things in the world. The first one, who has Kara Shema Yizbarach Shemai? That's mentioning a direct name of Hashem. You call out to Hashem and He answers you. But it's a specific name of Hashem, a specific relationship that Hashem has with that name that invokes a certain energy. And that will flow down into the world. And with that drawing forth of that energy, it might show up as something supernatural in this world. That's one method. The Hasheni, the second method, that's coercing Malachim by using one of Hashem's names. That you're forcing this angel to do more than it normally would. We're using this term, forcing this angel. Is, is it... A, a negative thing to do that? I mean, is, is this sinful in nature to, to coerce an angel forcefully? We'll get to that. We, we will discuss that very shortly. But we're using this word because there shouldn't be any confusion about it. It's not the malach has no ability to decide whether or not it wants to obey. Mm. You are 
you are invoking Hashem's authority to command this malach. Right. And it and it must obey. If you push something, it will it will fall over. Mm. So that's what you're doing with these malachim. The Amnam. Now we need to know, however, Ain Shum Echad Minha with either of these two methods, Muchlatim the Adam, they are not completely given over to whatever your will is. So a person might think after hearing all of this so far, they might think, well, now that we've figured out a way to hack the system, I could really do whatever I want. Because if I had access to the source code, I can just program anything I like and that'll show up in the world. I, right? I can it, make- it certainly leads you to think that, that you would have uh, a leg up on everyone else. I don't know for sure if I would come to the conclusion that I could do whatever I want just because he mentioned previously in this chapter that we're still kind of bound to, to rules and laws of nature. Good. Okay, so that's his point now. He just wants to reinforce that point that we shouldn't think that now that we have access to these names, we can reprogram anything we like in the world to make fire cold and wet <laughs> and to build out of nothing uh, you know, a 40-story building. It doesn't work like that. Our access is limited. They, it has definitions and limitations. There are limits to what we can affect. And also in what ways we'll be successful if we attempt it. It's also possible that Hashem might override our ability to hack the system. Even in a method that was given over to us, that we know should work, Hashem might just cancel it. Just like in the natural world, if a person would try to do something, Hashem might override that. Now, the truth is, in the second example, in the natural world, that would be less likely to happen. At least, because in most cases, we think about that, it would be supernatural. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, if I go to grab a chair and Hashem doesn't want me to grab the chair, and then my hand goes straight through it, or the chair falls, you know, the, mm -hmm. it would require some act of supernatural interference in order for that interruption to occur. Right. Uh, not always, because it could be that Hashem might cause me to stumble and trip, and I won't grab it. So there, it could be veiled in a way that looks natural. But by and large, in the physical realm, it would require a supernatural intervention that maybe wouldn't occur. But when it comes to this, using these names, it doesn't require an act of supernatural intervention because all of these things are happening behind the scenes anyway. This is an extra ability that humans have to tap into the source code and hack the system. And Hashem might override that. And that wouldn't require at all any sort of ostensibly supernatural intervention. It just wouldn't work. Hmm. So the point he's making here is that we need to be aware that even though these things are possible, A, they're very limited in our scope of what we can accomplish, and B, it might not work at all. It might just be canceled if Hashem wants that. I see. All right, so we know that sometimes invoking these names will work, and sometimes it's possible that God could intervene and decide that it's not going to work. I still don't know if I have a full answer to the earlier question, which I may not have asked in this exact way, but basically, why am I? Why would I not want to be trying to do this all the time? Good. We're, we're still getting there. We have. He will answer this question. Okay. So we're getting there soon. Ve'ulam l'shorish ha'echad shehu has korash shemayis barach lihimoshech mi menu hashba v'ada sheyitzdarach hakeruv elav yisbarach shemay v'adveikus boy. Now the first method that we explained, and that's the method of directly invoking a name of Hashem and drawing forth that energy. He says there is a condition that's required for that. And it, it requires a closeness to Hashem. A person needs to be a tzaddik. A person needs to be deeply cleaved to Hashem. Because really what this is, it's, a, it's an advanced form of tefillah. It's an advanced form of prayer that's supernatural. Um, but it's, 
it really is along those lines. And therefore, he says, and the more of a tzaddik he is, the more of a closeness of a relationship that he has with Hashem. Then the more successful his attempt will be. And the less of a relationship he has with Hashem, the more of a rasha he is, God forbid, it will become more and more difficult to accomplish that goal because this is just like prayer. If a person is a great tzaddik and he's very close to Hashem, then Hashem is more likely, so to speak, to answer his prayer because he is more of a clear conduit for Hashem's presence in this world already. If that makes sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. His, right, his mentioning of Hashem's name is he's, he is making himself a vessel and a conduit for that energy to come into the world. So the more, in general, of a vessel he is for Hashem, the more effective that's going to be. But the other method of forcing malachim, does not require this condition. Once this has been embedded in nature, once it's possible to invoke certain names that will then consequently coerce Malachim into doing things, that's just, it's almost like a natural occurrence. It happens in the spiritual world, but just like if I push something off a table, the loss of gravity will take hold. Mm -hmm. The same is true in the spiritual realms, that if I can tap into something, use this name, it will force a malach to do something, and that will happen regardless of how, much, how righteous I am, what kind of closeness of a relationship I have, because this is just the malach responding to a certain method that's been activated on him. Okay, therefore, and now we get to your question. Hadavar baru. Now the matter becomes clear. It is not appropriate for a simple person to be using the scepter of the king. Hmm. Because this is what we said before earlier. The way to, well, number one, to use the first method, of course, a person has to be extraordinarily righteous. Right. And that's a requirement. So a person on that level is already fully devoted to what Hashem wants and won't be using these these methods, these names, to invoke things for his own personal benefit. Right, right. He's yep. going to be interested in furthering so it's really what Hashem wants. The rest of us would be focusing on the second method of going to the angels and saying, hey, your boss told me to tell you. Exactly. And what that is, he's he gave a great analogy. He said, you're using the scepter of the king because what you're really doing, in effect, is you are invoking Hashem's authority. You are speaking with the authority of God to command an angel to do something. All right, I, I retract my question. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's, it's quite a serious thing. And even though that method is available, uh, it, it is available, and Hashem wants it to be available to certain people. A person has to be of a certain quality, and really there are two conditions. Number one is that they're a righteous person, because otherwise, even though even if you're not righteous, it might still be effective with the second method. And it's along these lines that our sages have taught us, He who uses the crown will die. And there's no, we don't have permission for this. Only holy people, that are very close to Hashem, who him by and cleave to him, that they're only going to use these tools and these methods in order to further the sanctification of Hashem's name in this world. And to perform Hashem's will whenever it's necessary. And without that, it could, it's possible that Hashem won't prevent you. It is possible for a person to learn these methods to learn how to pronounce these names appropriately and what kind of conditions that are required for it, to coerce malachim into doing things for them, and they might work. However, 
A person will be punished for that. How dare you commandeer Hashem's authority to start pushing Malachim around to perform your own benefits? This is, it's just this interesting catch-22 that I'm imagining, because I, I like to imagine that a, a righteous man knows he's righteous, and so that would mean that this path is available to him. He would say, well, what I've chosen to do with this is clearly in alignment with God's will. But also, you have to consider that a non-righteous man might just think that he's righteous uh, and and would and would also assume that this is a, a path available to him. You're not wrong. And therefore, anyone who's listening to this should be aware that tremendous caution is required. And the great Mukubalam, the Kabbalists warn everyone against doing this. And they say that even righteous people shouldn't be doing these kinds of things nowadays. Mm. It seems like the safe path. It right. It's just very dangerous and it's and in the vast, vast majority of cases, it's completely unnecessary. Hashem created a world for us to live within it, not, not to manipulate it and break it. Mm. Now, having said that, there are people, th- this is an important point, because there are, this practice is alive. There are people who are doing these things. Um, there are people who call themselves Kabbalists, uh, and they might be in terms of what they've learned and their, their practices. However, there are people that are doing these kinds of things and forcing Malachim to do certain tasks or writing amulets. Many of them may be charlatans, but even the ones that aren't, people will tend to think of them because they're performing miracles that maybe that they must be a righteous person and to seek their advice, etc., or their blessing. And it's not correct because th- there is no indication whatsoever just the fact that they are successful in performing supernatural things, that they, are, that they have any sort of righteousness. They have learned how to manipulate certain systems, and there is a high likelihood that they're doing so sinfully. So we need to be aware of this. We need to be very wary of people that claim these kinds of abilities and are doing them especially uh, often. Okay. And we already said earlier that this isn't completely given over to the will of man. You can't do whatever you want. There are strict rules for and limitations for what you're able to affect. And even within those boundaries and within those rules, it could be Hashem's decree to cancel out the effect. If Hashem decides that preventing what you're attempting to do would be the best course of action. Now, this, I've heard it come up. There was a woman who asked, not me, uh, Rabbi Lopiansky, and she was familiar with, with Kabbalah a little bit, and she understands that there are great tools available. And she asked, during World War II and the Holocaust, I mean, if we had access to these tools that we can teleport theoretically or perform supernatural acts, why, why did they not use these tools to save people? And we see that the question, the question is really, it falls apart because there, there are times in the world that Hashem makes a decree. It was a decree from Hashem that a third of the Jewish people needed to die. It's easier to answer that 80 years later with that what seems to be a, a clear, and I mean, that, that answer makes perfect sense, but you can understand how 50 years ago that wouldn't have been something that's easy to, to come to. It's emotionally painful. You can't understand why Hashem would decree such a thing in the moment. But yeah, but the, this woman asked it recently, and look, we, we, have, we, we know this isn't the first tragedy that the Jewish people have suffered. We've gone through many things, and even we have these ancient sources, the ten great righteous people that were that were brutally slaughtered by the Romans. We read about this on Tisha B'Av and on Yom Kippur. And before they went out to be killed by the Romans, they first consulted with the heavens because they wanted to know, was this a decree from Hashem or not? And it was, it was to find out this question. Because if it's not from Hashem, if 
if it's just the Romans attempting to kill them, then easily they could escape. Fight back, right? Fight back or just teleport away or, or something. Yeah. Invoke some sort of uh, override. But they found out from the heavens that this has been decreed. So that means one of two things. Number one, even if they would try to escape, it probably wouldn't work. But number two, they wouldn't want to escape because they understand these are people that are living on a level that they live to fulfill Hashem's will. And if this is what's required of the Jewish people, this will serve as painful and difficult as it might be. This is the next step in the tikkun, in fulfilling Hashem's will and perfecting the world. That's what they want to do. So there is such a thing as Hashem's decree. And that is the only thing we should be interested in is fulfilling Hashem's will. Mm. It's a tough charter. Right. It's, it's not so simple what I said because there are times where there's a decree that we try very hard to have annulled and we appeal to Hashem's mercy to have it annulled. And that, that's a path as well. Mm. Uh, but for, for people like us, simple Jews, we you know, do the mitzvahs, learn Torah, pray, ask Hashem for forgiveness. We do the normal things. We don't need to be determining whether or not we should override the system. Thank God. That's enough for me. Yeah. Number eight. After it's been decreed by Hashem that there should be, that there should exist in the world goodness and evil. Evil needs to exist on every possible level that it could. And man's work in this world is to prevent the dominion of evil and eliminate it in all of its paths on all of its levels. To the point where we can completely remove evil from the world. That is the goal. Now, look. When it comes to Hashem, Hashem is completely devoid of any sort of deficiency or lack. Like we said way back in the very first episode. And it's only within creation that it's possible to find deficiency, which then translates into evil. And so Hashem ordered that there should be levels of goodness for creation. And then Hashem manufactured evil that parallels those good levels as well. This is the, this is the existence that facilitates the, the ability for evil to manifest in this world. Can you help me out here because I'm I'm trying to follow along and I don't see how this is connected to the rest of the chapter. You will. We're we're backing up right now and just giving an overview of good and evil and the fact that there needs to be a parallel of good to evil. Okay. And that that evil always matches good. And like we'll see right now. The Yavah Adam Ba'avidasai and man comes in his work the Yasir Imin Yana Min Habriya Kula Esara Kula Man's work in this world is to eliminate that evil, and to establish in the world as hatov, goodness, forever. Mm. Therefore, that every element of good that exists in the world has an opposite to it, in evil. And that's what in the book of Kohelas, book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon said, even this against that God has made, meaning there's a parallel for everything. Whatever good there exists, there is a corresponding evil or potential for evil that exists as well. Hmm. That seems a little bit different. I, I'm trying to understand that concept uh, and, and incorporate it with the understanding that you know, God is one. God is the one true goodness. Uh, I mean, if if there exists a lack of goodness, it's because there is effectively a lack of Hashem in a certain area. 
it seems like th- that what I what I just said, what we learned way earlier in the book, is an idea that I mean, goodness is is filling everything, and this idea seems to be more like there's a duality uh, within within everything. Well, there's no contradiction, and in fact, he's going to reinforce what you just said right now when he says, "There's one thing that good has over evil." And that is that the that goodness is rooted in reality. Goodness is an emanation of Hashem's existence, mm. so to speak. Thank God. And evil is only a manufactured and artificial existence that was created only for the sake of being eliminated. The mm. and it's not to be used. To answer your question, there truthfully only exists in in the root realms good. Only goodness comes from Hashem directly. What what evil is, is a potential for misinterpreting God, for, for not perceiving Hashem in the world. And that exists in any capacity where where there's a possibility for good, there is an equal possibility for that deficiency as well that exists in this world. And that is how the world remains in a state of balance so that our free will becomes effective. I see. Okay. So some people might misinterpret this in thinking that there is, in fact, in the fundamental nature of reality, a balance between good and evil, and we have to choose a side, whereas we know that the reality is, no, good is good is the source or right. rather true. god is the source which is true goodness exactly yeah that in the in the truest essence of things there's only goodness but there is a balance of good and evil from our perspective living here in this world that facilitates our free will okay thank you yeah that clarifies it number 9 now here's why number 8 was relevant why are we talking about good and evil all of a sudden what does that have to do with our topic answer for the following vehine Along those lines, just like it's possible for a person to achieve a great revelation of Hashem, deep knowledge and insight into spiritual matters, Ruach HaKodesh, which we'll talk about with Hashem's help in the next episode, that is supernatural, it's required that corresponding to all of this great ability that a man could have to achieve these supernatural things and cleaving to Hashem and invoking Hashem's names and being that close, that there is the possibility for doing a similar effect, but on the opposite scale. For evil. Yes. Well, not for evil, but using evil means. Hmm. And that's man's ability to draw forth darkness and obscurity and a spirit of impurity from the world. All of these, these what we were talking about before, how evil is manufactured yeah. in the world. There is an existence of evil that shows up here. It's not sourced in anything real. It is truly superficially... Uh, manufactured and it's artificial. However, it shows up in this world as something tangible, as something real, and there are forces that are generating these things. So a person can use those as well. In an unnatural way. And that's what the the spiritual impurity of sorcery is. And seeking out the dead, communing with the dead, these things that the huh. Torah by name has specified and said, don't do these things. So help me out here. I, I know what, I, you know, communing with the dead, but sorcery, how is that inherently different from what we've been talking about uh, up till this point? So it, it's the exact opposite of what we've been talking about until this point. Using names of Hashem is operating the world how it actually exists. There are divine energies that come straight from Hashem down the chain that show up in this world. If you know how to identify them, 
and how to call them to action, you can activate them. That's what we've been talking about up until now. However, since that ability exists, Hashem gave a corresponding evil ability to tap into not those actual names that generate those real energies, but things that exist in manufactured evil. These evil forces that show up in this world, and a person can invoke that instead. And what will happen is, it might be, it might show up here in this world, the exact same result. You might see the exact same thing, the same effect, but the method of operation is the complete opposite. The inyanim hu hamshich al yidei has karais, and the way this works is as a result of, again, mentioning names. It is a verbal invocation, b'tanoim yiduim, with very specific conditions, hashpa'is hatuma v'zuama. You're invoking these dark, evil energies. Mashu ha'richu k'ayoy sergadu mimeni yisbarach shemai. The thing that is farthest away from Hashem they could possibly be. Hefech ha'devekus mo'ibamash. The complete opposite of cleaving to Hashem. You're cleaving to darkness. V'adavar nimshach me'oisim k'ayches harash z'acharno b'chelek rishon perech hamishi and it's drawn forth from these forces of ra, of evil, that we explained back in section 1, chapter 5. Shehusma lehem begezerosi yismarach shemais. Hashem has given names to these forces as well, and they can be identified and invoked just like Hashem's names can. V'yemashech al yedei zeh mehem meshech atuma b'madregos yedueis shaleka derech ateva. And it's possible to draw those forth on their own respective levels that is also unnatural or supernatural. V'chein ye'osu al yedei hem maisim. And therefore it's possible to use this to perform acts here in this world, that are not natural things, like the actions of sorcerers and the like. And all of this is all of this is in accordance with the respective abilities of these dark forces that are also limited, just like on the side of holiness and Kedusha from Hashem's names and the malachim who operate there, it's also limited in a very similar way the access to these dark forces. Hmm. It's also possible, there's another method, that you can perform otherwise physically impossible tasks by using the help of shadim, which we spoke about earlier in the series. And according to whatever they're able to manipulate in the world, you can make deals with them. This all sounds extremely dangerous. Of course. <laughs> it's better left alone. Absolutely. Now, in accordance with the extent of your ability to perform these acts, it has been decreed by Hashem that the operations of nature, which would happen otherwise, get pushed away when these dark forces become invoked. That, that push it off their normal course. And it's important to speak this out because this is where the fundamental difference shows up. If, if a person would invoke a divine name of Hashem, you are directly manipulating the system. And then everything happens consequently as a result of that invocation of that name reality just naturally changes mm -hmm. because that's what you did however if a person is invoking the forces of evil things that happen in this world are not determined or structured based on the forces of evil they come from hashem's energy into this world and so therefore if a person is going to tap into forces of evil and manipulate those, there's an added step that's required that Hashem has to, again, artificially push away all of those natural systems that would be occurring in accordance with your activation of those dark forces to give the impression that you are directly manipulating the system. So why, why does he want to push things away to allow people to, 
supernaturally bring evil into the world, even, even more so than there already is. So that's what he explained earlier, is that there needs to be a balance of at least a potential balance of possibility that anything that's, that we're able to achieve on the side of good. Oh, right. Okay. So because we can use the Shamos, there has to be an opportunity for us to use the, the evil names as well. Right. There's access to everything on both sides. I see. It makes sense. And they come together. Now our sages have this phrase, sorcery interferes with the dominion of heaven. So what that means is that Hashem has to artificially hold things back and interrupt the, the normal system of things because this person decided to activate dark forces and so now we need to interfere. Hashem has to interfere with the divine realms and break the system to maintain that appearance of power that this person is invoking. Now, this, own, this effect of Hashem interrupting the world, it's only in accordance with that degree to the point that the person has activated these dark forces and no more. And even within that realm of possibility for a person to affect, it's also possible that the entire act could be canceled out, just like what we mentioned earlier with Shamos. The whole thing could just be denied by Hashem. And that's what our sages said when we quote the Torah verse, Ein od milvado, there is nothing else besides Hashem. And our sages interpreted that even sorcery, which means that Hashem has complete dominion over things, even if a person would interrupt the world by activating forces of evil, which should override the system. Hashem has ultimate authority over all of creation and can cancel that as well, of course. And it's been explained that this will happen for someone that has a tremendous amount of merit. That from the heavens, they will save him from these people that wish to harm him with their sorcery. And this is what our sages said in the Talmud. Shani Rabbi Hanino, the Nafish Zuhuse. Rabbi Hanino is different because he had a tremendous amount of merit. The context was that normally we have to protect ourselves from sorcery. Now, not so much anymore because people aren't really doing these things. But a couple thousand years ago, this was more common practice for especially non-Jews. Mm -hmm. Well, this, is, this has got to be connected to what we had mentioned before, where, you know, the paganism with its roots in uh, or connection to some sort of truth. Uh, I mean, it was, it was revealed to some extent because people just had a deeper spiritual connection with the divine. Uh, so by the same token, it makes perfect sense that people would have at some point on both sides, on good and evil side, have had a greater connection to Shamos and sorcery. Yes. Yeah, there was there was high level access and it was dangerous because they were they were able to really harm people. And there are there are many halachas that we find. There are laws in the Gemara that we adhere to in order to pr protect ourselves from attacks, supernatural attacks using using these kinds of forces. And that's, again, that's less relevant today because people just don't know how to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. People have lost that connection, but it still theoretically exists. And what we're seeing here is that no matter how proficient a person could be with using these dark forces, it's always possible that a truly righteous person is completely immune to it. Because Hashem just says, you cannot affect him using these dark forces. So what about the danger that the Jewish people are in in the face of someone like Bilaam? So Bilaam was not using dark forces. Bilaam was actually using the first methods. Mm. He was able to understand when Hashem's trait of anger was manifest. Okay, and so this is the mazel. Going back to a couple episodes ago, I think. Mm. Right? We were talking about the mazels that... that uh, 
correspond to each what time of time of day and so each one is uh I, i'm not sure it has to do with mazel because mazel is more related to the the position of the cosmos and, and the energy flowing through there okay um it could be that it's related but he he understood that there's a certain trait of hashem that's manifest every day and he was able to invoke that and this was his mistake actually when when we said earlier that just because a person might have access to these tools does not mean he can do whatever he wants. And Bilaam was under the impression that he could, that he became skilled enough. He knew how to hack the system. He knew how to use this trait of Hashem being manifest in the world of, of anger and how to channel that into cursing his enemies. And he thought that he could use it for whatever he likes and he learned his lesson. Use it to go against the will of God. Right. It's funny, using God's power to go against his own will. Exactly. And it doesn't work out very well. Right. And he learned that lesson. So that concludes chapter two. The next chapter will discuss Ruach HaKodesh, Divine Spirit, and Prophecy. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. Thank you, Rabbi.